Because this conference will now be recorded. I will definitely do that. I'm doing that now. Thank you. All right. So just for the recording, I was telling everyone about patientadvocate.org. It's a website that's available to all patients. If you need any kind of assistance, you can reach out to them and see if they can help. And then the other thing that I wanted to share with you is um, this year, um, FSR is doing a lot of cool things. And one of those things is um, this Saturday, um, they're doing Qigong and that's free online. Um, and I am so sorry, my brain is forgetting how to find the link for that. <laughs> Oh my goodness, that's what happens when I don't feel good. I'm so sorry, you guys. Um, but I, I'm really excited about some of the things that FSR is offering. Oh, sorry, Leah, it's Foundation for Sarcoidosis Research. And um, I apologize, that was the very first organization I found after I was diagnosed. And so my brain just thinks that everybody that finds me already knows about them. Um, so I apologize for assuming that, um, but I will try to share those links that also, yeah, so Kathleen put their website up there, um, but they had some meditation, um, that you could do, but I missed out on that and I didn't share it with anybody either, but now the Qigong I know is this Saturday and then they're doing Sark socials throughout the year. You can probably find all this stuff on the website as well if my brain doesn't allow me to share the links. Um, but that's just what I wanted to share with you before we go around and check in. And oh, Yvonne's here. Let's see who else has got here that I didn't notice. We got Yvonne and Elizabeth. Elizabeth was here when I arrived, but her camera's. Who's on. Yvonne? Hi, hey, Yvonne. Who's that, who's that last one, JG? Uh, that's me, uh, James Loisang. Oh, hi. hi there. Hi. Okay, so let's see. So we're going to go around, and I'm really bad about the introductions. I usually make them take the whole hour. So I'm going to try to be good today, and we're going to try to give ourselves 30 seconds to do an introduction. So I am, um, yeah, I was looking at the minute hand at first. Don't do that because then you'll be doing 30 minutes for your introduction. So um, I'm going to let you guys self-police on the 30 seconds, though. So um, I am so sorry. My brain is only half here, and there's no second hand on my watch, and I, I don't know what to do with that. So I'm just going to go. <laughs> I was going to say, do you want me to set one up? I, have, I can do it on my phone for you. Oh, that'd be great, Spencer. Make kind of a game of it. Sure. Uh, okay, so. tell me when to go. Ready and go. All right. My name is Susie Torres. I am an ambassador with the Foundation for Sarcoidosis Research, and I am also a moderator here in the online support group. And I was diagnosed in 2017, but I've been chronically ill all my life. And... Um, yeah, I've, I, I am really tired of doctors and needles and PET scans. I had a cardiac PET scan last week and regular PET scan today. And that's why I'm feeling kind of crappy and my brain doesn't work 100%. But um, yeah, so that's all I've really got to say right now. <laughs> Thank you. Perfect. Spence. 28 <laughs> seconds. So, woohoo. Okay. Go ahead, Spencer, you take charge. So uh, I'm Spencer. I'm one of the youngest patients ever diagnosed at National Institute of Health. I was diagnosed when I was four years old. They thought I've had it since six months and I've been dealing with it my whole life. So I know nothing different. Um, you'll probably see me on the Sarcoid page. Uh, and if you ever need somebody to reach out to, uh, I'm always somebody you can. Um, I've been through most of it probably all of it at this point. So once again, if you have questions or comments or concerns about it, let me know. That's it for me. 
Thank you, Spencer. Yeah. So okay. I guess I'll, I'll go next. Is that all right? That's fine. Yeah, thank you. Go ahead. Hi, everybody. My name is Kathleen. I'm an ambassador for the Foundation of Sarcoidosis Research for the past six years, as well as a moderator here uh, for, found, for the National Sarcoidosis Online Support Group. You can also reach me on Facebook. I answer pretty quickly. Um, if you know my phone number or you get it from there, please the if you know, the reach out to me. And I have had sarcoidosis for the past 12 years, and it's everywhere except for my eyes and my kidneys at this point. That's all for me. Uh, I'll go next. Uh, I'm Brian Stein. I'm from Irvine, California. Uh, I've had sarcoid for the last 26 years. Um, been pretty dormant for the last five years, and only started uh, acting up in the last five years. So it's in my lungs and in my uh, mediastinal lymph nodes. So on prednisone at the moment, and trying to see what I can do next. Well, welcome, Brian. Thank you. Yes, again. thank you, Brian. So Susan, would you like to go next? Oh, we can't hear you. I think you're unmuted. You're, unmuted. you're on mute, Susan. There we are. Better? Okay. Susan Bassey, I'm from New Jersey. Um, I'm new, just signed up for the support group. So this is my in the pocket inside. <laughs> um, I'm new to being diagnosed only in 2019. I've been sick for, though, about They're four years. The real so thing. The diagnosis, mostly um, pulmonary, um, rheumatoid issues, and I'm in the middle of cardiac possible diagnosis right now with some neurological stuff too. It's a book. Well, definitely welcome, Susan. Thank yeah, you. welcome. Yeah, I hope you find some support here. I'm sorry that you're dealing with that. Thank you. Um, and I probably got past my 30 seconds, but I just wanted to say. Okay. And you're both with the Foundation for Sarcoid Research that I was yeah. just um, selected for their patient advocate committee. So oh, yay. just started. Yay. Congratulations. Thank you. Yes, congrats. Okay, when we're doing the introductions, if I could ask everybody that's not speaking to mute themselves, and then um, it'll be easier for us to hear. Um, who wants to volunteer to go next? Did you raise your hand, Leah? <laughs> like, hey, go ahead, say your name. Hi, I'm Jaden. So this is Jaden. Um, I'm mom. So Jaden was diagnosed in May of this last year um, with sarcoidosis after he had a presentation, uh, swollen lymph nodes in his next down mostly just his left side of the body um, and he lost his central vision. Um, so he was diagnosed with uveitis also. Um, we've gotten his vision back, but they're still trying to find good meds to stabilize him. Yeah, I guess that's it right now. We're looking for good support groups, some for so, kids, teens. <laughs> um, so if he ever needs somebody to reach out to sort of close to his age and that's dealt with it, have him reach out to me. I've done it all. I've done prednisone, Remicade, Humira, all of it. And I also have uveitis and hence the glasses. But if anybody, this goes for anybody, if you need help to, you know, get something going, let me know. I will talk to you, talk you through what I've been through in the past. So thank you. Welcome, Jaden. Okay, let's see. Yvonne, do you want to go next? Uh, I'm Yvonne from Fredericksburg, Virginia. I moved back to Fredericksburg, uh, ambassador for FSR. Um, they recently did uh, an article um, in the, I can't, I was looking for the book. I can't think of the name of it, but um FSR uh, sent my name in and they did an article. I can't think of the name of the book uh, this month. 
and they're supposed to be sending me some. And when they do, I will let you guys know. Do you know what it is, Susie? No. Do you know what the I'm, name of the I'm sorry, the I can remember is? the I remember the post on Facebook, but my brain's not at full capacity tonight. So I apologize. I can't remember right now. Okay. <laughs> Mine either. <laughs> okay. But thank you. All, All right. right. Wendy, do you want to take 30 seconds to introduce yourself? I am Wendy Schleyer. I live in Rochester, New York. I have neurosarcoid, lymphoid sarcoid. Um, it's probably in my thyroid, what my thyroid doctor told me, but there's nothing you can do for it. And um, it might be in my liver. That's it. That's enough, right? That's a lot to deal with. Thank you for sharing. Let's see, Elizabeth, would you like to go next? Hi, everyone. My name is Elizabeth. I'm in Wisconsin. And I was just diagnosed over the Christmas holidays. Um, and I'm just learning about it. I'm on medical leave right now. I'm a teacher. And I kept thinking it was because of all the pressure that was on me with teaching and found out it was more. So I'm, this is new. I'm just going to sit here and listen to you guys tell me all about it. Welcome, Elizabeth. And um, yeah, I'm sorry that you had to join this club, but you are very welcome here and we'll do our best to support you. Thank you. Okay, so let's see. I don't know why I can't see the names of the people that don't have their cameras on. Um, I have James is also here. Okay, James, do you want to take your turn? Sure, I'll be quick. Um, I've been with this wonderful, I was just going to tell Elizabeth, I've been with this group a year and a half, and I have learned so much from them. They, it's really a wonderful resource. Um, I'm one of the lucky ones. Uh, about last summer, I had uh, a PET scan and my sarcoidosis in my heart and my spleen and one of my ribs is gone. Uh, but what I learned from this group is it's just dormant. So I want to continue to work with this group and, and help others and uh, track my own progress. But uh, my AFib has started to go away completely thanks to the sarcoidosis being gone. So I think that's 30 seconds. I'm done. <laughs> Thank you, James. Yeah, thank you. Um, there's a Liz as well, Susie. Okay. Liz, hey. do you want to introduce yourself? Hi, this is Liz. I live in Maryville, Tennessee. This is my second meeting with y'all. And I was diagnosed with sarcoidosis in 2016. Thank you, Liz. We're glad to have you. And I love that you're from Maryville, Tennessee, because the only person I know from there is my daughter-in-law. <laughs> and I'll probably tell you that every time. Thank you. <laughs> Liz, we're in Tennessee, too. Oh, yeah. What part? We're in Clarksville. Okay. I'm not sure where that is, but <laughs> is that near Nashville? Or Campbell. Okay. Thanks. And Susie, there's a sham shamrock girl. Shamrock girl, is that your real name? I guess they're not there right now. Okay, then. Um, well, I was thinking about, um, You know, I had ideas, and it, now that I'm trying to talk about it, it's a little bit harder to verbalize. So I guess I I was going to use what I've been going through as a platform to launch off of to talk to. So maybe I'll I'll just be like I'm the one with the problem this time, and you guys can help me, right? 
So I have been dealing with sarcoidosis. And um, so January 2017 is when the big part of my journey started. And I really, I'm going to get emotional. I really wanted to just go to the doctor and get a pill so I could go back to work. And um, of course, you all know there isn't such pill. <laughs> and um, uh, like Kathleen, I'm allergic to so many things that I have not had a lot of luck with treatments. And um, I, I've just found myself in a place lately that I don't want to do my IVIG and I'm short tempered with medical assistance and I don't want to see doctors and I'm sick of needles. And um, I just, I don't want going to the doctor to be my full-time job anymore. I want a different life. I want to quit this job and do something else. But we don't get that choice, do we? I mean, yeah. I don't know who chooses when it goes into remission. It just seems like the lottery, but um, I haven't won that lottery. And so um, I guess let's go around again and I'll let you guys give me tips if you want to um, for how do you deal with that? How do you keep going every day when you're dealing with this stuff? So one of the ways I tend to deal with it lately um, is through journaling. I take probably 10 minutes every day, more often at night, right before I'm about to go to bed, and I just write everything down. Um, you know, con basically anything I think of, it spills onto the page, be it good, bad, or ugly. Um, I just let it go, and that's kind of my venting process. Um, and then one of the things that I've always found useful is... Um, complex case managers. I know I talk about that a lot, but those will help more and more than you will ever know. Um, I got lucky and got a good one. Um, all of them are good. So that's how I would deal with it. That's my personal advice. Thank you, Spencer. Spencer, I have a question for you that I'm sure um, if I'm thinking it, other people can. So I know you've mentioned complex case manager a few times. Is there a fee to that? And how do you find one in your immediate area? So the way I found one is I have Kaiser Permanente. Um, you can always call their member services line. It's part of being part of KP. There's no fee to it. There's nothing to it. But they are the ones that on your behalf will always talk to the doctor. And I found that mine translates it into plain English for me instead of giving me all the uh, hospital jargon. And that's taken a load off my shoulders of trying to force Dr. A to talk to Dr. B and Dr. C to talk to all of them. Um, they will, the complex case manager basically compiles all that so long as you tell them, hey, as, as long as you tell the doctor, hey, forward it to this person as well. The notes you've taken, forward them that way. Um, and like I said, through Kaiser Permanente, I, uh, it's part of it. You just call your complex or you call member services for those in Georgia or elsewhere. Um, I think Chasta might know, but I believe there is a site that will also put you in touch with complex case managers should your insurance not uh, be able to do that. Um, hey everybody. So to answer that question vaguely, um, there are a couple of resources. I would definitely, I'm just getting home y'all. Um, so give me a second. If you give me by the next meeting date, I will have, uh, those couple of websites on where you can find complex case managers, where you can find an advocate for not just only your specific disease and illness, but for others as well. Um, Kathleen, we talked about this at training last year too. So that's one of the websites I'm going to use definitely. Um, so there are a couple of different places. Also, um, you can ask, um, for a case manager at your particular doctor's office. Um, and they'll help you 
with the complex case manager um, for an overall. They'll what they'll do is they'll sign you up. They'll take on your case and then they'll sign you up and then they'll relieve themselves once they find you somebody else. So um, you can definitely ask your primary care doctor. Definitely. They have a case manager that's in their office. And so they'll get you hooked up and then um, they'll take the reign and then they'll pass it on. So, yeah. Excellent. Thank you, Chasta, for that, because I think we all could use those um, websites, if you don't mind. So absolutely. The next meeting. So what I'll do is when I find them, if everybody is in the group, once I find the websites, I'll go ahead and post them in the group. Thank you. So Susie, I think I'll continue if that's all right. Thanks. So I, as I stated, I have had seven And Susie, here. the the oops. Um, I've had it for twelve years, uh, the sarcoidosis, and it's um, slowly taking over my life. So similar to Susie, I too am in not necessarily a very good place but um by learning from all of you some of the things that i've been doing is i started a blog and i actually published it i thought i would not but i did um not all my friends have connection to it i feel that the people in i'll do this the normal people don't understand what we go through um how could they, honestly? You know, okay, so they broke an arm. Yes, it was painful. Yes, they were screaming in pain, but this is every day for all of us. This is, and it seems like every other day I get, I feel like a whack-a-mole. I come out of a hole and then all of a sudden, bam, you have cardiac sarcoidosis. Okay, bring up my head, bam, you have this. And it just keeps happening. So um, yes, of course my family, knows about it can they really understand they can't and i i'm not one of those that that wants oh kathleen i'm so sorry i hate that all right so um i stopped working last year i've been trying to get disability it has not been approved so that's another frustration in my world um and this is what everybody's gone through as well so um i'm also a ballroom dancer I've also started a group called Roll Call Wheelchair Dance. So it's for people who are seated. They're called seated partners, whether they be in a wheelchair or just can't walk properly or their legs are not that strong, I try to do upper body. However, because of the sarcoidosis, my sarcoidosis is taking away that too. I'm 53 years of, as a dancer. That's who I was. That's how I got my frustrations out, my happiness, my sadness, my pissed offness all of that and i'm not sure where i'm going yet to be 100 percent honest with you but i do know with this group you know some tuesdays and thursdays i feel like oh god do i, I really can't do it and once i come on and i see all of you it, it's like oh, it validates me it's like okay you know what you're good for another week or two so, and then I know I can always reach out to Spencer or Chasta or Yvonne. I've, I, I've been hitting up Yvonne quite a bit, Susie too. I can just pick up the phone and call Susie, you know, and I don't know. It's just, I'm in a weird place too, Susie. You know, I'm with you. I'm tired of doctors. I don't want to do the Remicade. The Remicade, I'm not, do feel, I'm not feeling it. I feel no different. <laughs> I've had four doses. I feel sick. I have headaches. Now I got to take and two more pills for the headaches so that I can sleep. Oh my God, it's just a, it's, I, I feel like a mess. So realize that that is part of this, but I promise you, we all come out in the end, um, you know, because we're on Facebook together and we see our struggles. So Susie, you know, I'm always there for you and I wanna go punch out the doctors too. I'll come with you. I, I said to, I said to see before we even started guys i wished i lived closer to her you know i wish we all could be in one commune and and help each other and bolster each other up you know every day because okay spencer might feel horrible today and i'm okay today so come on spencer what do you need you know i i wish we were that close um because i know that we could work together so but realize that we are here i mean 
the moderators here care about everybody. Susie's a moderator, Yvonne's a moderator, Chasta's a moderator. And there's so many others that you haven't met yet. So realize we are here with you. We are also patients. So what works for me or what works for Spencer with the Remicade may not work for me. <laughs> I, I give it this because I will admit that Remicade is no fun. Um, I got lucky. My um, infusion nurses said, hey, we can decrease this from two hours to one. Um, so it's only an hour in a chair, but um, I'm still out for three days. With the, after Remicade, I'm bedridden for three days, and it's no fun. So I will admit that. Ooh. Okay, y'all are giving y'all are giving Jaden like this little oof. They're trying to put him on Remicade, and he's like, "I'm not taking that shit." And I'm like, "Yes, you're gonna do whatever they tell so, you." To do. So now no. you have to help reverse the reverse the here now. Well, let me let me say Battling this. with a 15 year old here. Somebody help. Yeah. Okay. So Remic my Remicade story is different. I've been on Remicade since 2008. Um, so that's right at what 12 years now to almost 13 years and Remicade does, has done wonders for me um, It's Remicade is what knocked me into remission <clears throat> so um, it knocked me into remission and um, of course I get the pre-meds and my treatment lasts two two and a half hours um, we tried the whole hour thing didn't work my vein all my veins blew um all that kind of stuff like that so after we finally got a consistent you know everything was fine the two and a half hours worked well for me uh with the pre-meds i sleep the rest of that particular day and the next day i'm still kind of groggy but after that um I, it's like the energizer bunny i just keep going and going and going until it's time again so the remicade has done amazing for me um I'm sorry that it's, you know, everybody else doesn't have that story. My hope and prayer is that everything that works for me works for everybody else. But because we are snowflakes, it just doesn't happen that way. But don't be discouraged. Again, like yes, Kathleen said, yes, what works for. Can I ask you something? Um, I I was on a generic Remicade. Um, are, and, are, were any of you on um, straight Remicade or generic? Could generic be worse than the Remicade or? Actually, yeah. Remicade, Remicade is the generic, and Fliximab is the proper one, is the real so one. I was on the Interacept. Oh, you were on the third, the third, the third phase of the uh, Infliximab. Hmm. I didn't yeah, even know. Yeah, so Infli Infliximab is the original drug, and then it's different phases of the Infliximab. Remicade being one, the one that Wendy did, and I think it's like three more. I have to do proper research to that one. So yeah, it's different. It's different in flicks and maps and Remicade being one of those. So yeah. Um, they didn't ask me about that one, Wendy. He just went straight to Remicade and that's what I agreed to. Yeah, well so, I had told me it was Remicade, but then I read the bag and it said Interacept and then I Yeah, Interacept is in flicks and maps. And in flicks and map is, is what I was getting, not just yeah. I, I just call it Remicade. It's a heck of yeah. a lot simpler. So, uh, Jaden has a question real fast. Okay. Hey, Jaden. <laughs> yeah, ask her. Come on, this is your stuff. What about the first time that you took it? Okay, so the very first time I took it, um, I had a high dosage of it because of how aggressive my sarcoidosis was. Um, so they're going to give you your first dose based off of how aggressive your sarcoidosis <laughs> is affecting your body. So what they're going to do is they're going to probably put an IV into your arm. Um, they're going to give you Benadryl and Tylenol for your pre-med so that nothing happens while you're on, uh, while they're injecting the drug into the IV, into your veins. Um, you're probably going to fall asleep because you're probably not going to be used to that much Tylenol and Benadryl at the same time. So you're probably going to be a little groggy and a little tired. Um, but trust me, it will wear off. I say give yourself a day or two because you're so young. Give yourself about a day or two. Um, and you'll, you'll definitely bounce back quicker than this 34 year old <laughs> and you'll probably definitely bounce back quicker than Susie and Kathleen. So, um, you're, you're going to be fine. Trust me. Um, yeah. cause you're going to be around a whole lot of nurses. So don't be afraid. Take you a lot of reading material, take your games, 
take your Nintendo Switch, all of that good stuff. So you might be there for a, for a little couple hours. So um, yeah, you'll probably be a little tired um, while you're, you know, once the Tylenol and Benadryl starts to, you know, set in and stuff, you're probably gonna um, get, you know, groggy in your eyes and you might drift off to sleep and stuff like that, but, but you're gonna be awesome. fine. Yeah. Drink lots of water. Yeah, drink lots yes. of oh, yeah, definitely drink lots of water. Yeah. Lots of water. So yes. what I do with that, if I know my treatments are on Monday. Before you go. Yes. Yeah, um, my treatment is usually on Monday. So all day Sunday, I'm drinking water. All day Sunday. Getting a whole lot of water in my system. And even on um on Monday morning when my treatment happens, I'm drinking all water. Um you can take snacks. I know my, my treatment place allows us to bring snacks and stuff in. So you can eat while you're on it. It's not going to affect anything. Um, so if you get hungry, hey, take a snack um, and stuff like that. So, yeah, you may feel a little groggy afterwards. Um, but then again, you being young, you might want to go run a marathon. I'm not doing all yep. that. <laughs> so, I did you know. work on the cancer ward, too. <laughs> um, yeah. My treatment center, they do it all. They do chemo. They do dialysis. All that kind of stuff like that. But if you, they, they also have private rooms at my treatment center. Yep. So if I want a private room, I can just ask for a private room. But because you're his mom, um, a lot of places are going to give you a little private area because it's just the two of y'all. And if it's his first time, they're probably going to give him a private area. Yeah. Because they're going to treat him at, at the the Vanderbilt Children's in Nashville. Oh, yeah. He's going to be fine. Yeah. Yeah, so I was just kind of, I was thinking, I'm telling his teachers and stuff, I'm like, he'll be on Zoom, don't worry about it, it's going to be okay, you're going to do school, you better get up and go. Like, <laughs> well, and so, mama, <laughs> so, you can take the Chromebook if you want to, but uh, you may be the one doing the work instead of him. You're going to be asleep. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, speaking from somebody that was his age, um, so a little bit of my story is I was off Remicade for, I was on Remicade for a little bit, and then I had a change in rheumatology doctors, and they swapped me from Remicade to prednisone. It's a prednisone methotrexate combo. And then I went back to the uh, rheumatologist that I originally had that put me on Remicade. And he's like, why in the world would they put you on prednisone again? Um, and I... My little kind of horror story is I was on prednisone from eight years old to about 16. And it did, uh, for those of you who are on prednisone and know, it is no fun. They, you know, I think Frank calls them the devil's Tic Tacs. So um, Remicade is, well, yes, I'm out for three days. Um, everybody's different. And especially young, I was... You know, when I was on it 15, at 15, I was running through walls. Um, I felt indestructible. And now that I'm a little bit older, at 25, I'm like, okay, no, this is not the same thing. Um, and then I know my, mo uh, my mother, who basically helped me through this when I was real young, she basically, we didn't let this become like a disability. We treated it as normal. But she did have a spacing on the number. I think it's a, a 504 plan that basically says teachers have to give you special accommodations like, you know, a cushion seat if you can't sit for a long time, extra time on tests and all that stuff. So I that's what I would recommend on for you. Um, obviously, I'm not a doctor, but that's kind of my story about Remicade. So it's not bad. Trust me. It's, it's a day off school. <laughs> that's what I'll tell you. Well, and I, I definitely agree with Spencer um, with the school district here. Um, they have those accommodations also with um, and you want to check your job too, mama, to see what accommodations they have for you when it comes to the FMLA and all that kind of stuff like that. Um, but with Jaden's thing, my hands are super full. I got a husband with a traumatic brain injury and severe PTSD. Okay, gotcha. Now I got this. So I'm at home anyway. So. Okay. Yeah. So just check. Um, you can call the school, the principal. And if he doesn't know directly, um, you can definitely call down to the school district's office. Um, Cause they definitely have it to where he can be set up for all of that. It won't count against him or anything like that. 
Yeah, he's he he's got an IEP um, right now. We just did. They they pretty much pushed it forward because everything here is school and traditional. So he's at home. Um, but they've. I mean, the school's been great with working with pretty much everything. So um, it's just hard because of the uveitis and being virtual, like, you know, and nothing stabilized and he's still on prednisone and he's on Celsep and we're doing Humira injections weekly and he's still relapsing and it's back to the doctor. And to the Do college. you have um, a Vogue Rehabilitation Center near you? Or Vogue Rehab. And the reason why I say that is because um, the Vogue Rehab here um is a nationwide sector and what vogue rehab did for me when i had the real bad uveitis that set in they hooked me up with um tools materials that were free of charge um and stuff like that um so that he would be able so he has the chromebook um i'm assuming y'all use chromebook for virtual school he uses well no i, I get, use my own laptop yeah you I do because those are the small the words right smart. gotcha um, so what vote the i institute the i ins they're not the i institute what is it the something in nashville he's got a i miss henderson she's like the i person mm -hmm. for the uh, county yeah. and she does his stuff and it's supposed Indy. to be setting up um everything that he's supposed to need and go back and forth it's just everything just takes time yeah and see Vogue, what Vogue rehab would do is they would give me everything i need to enlarge the words they gave me my own personal laptop um that would with the programs and stuff downloaded um so that if i needed to make the words bigger on the screen they would do all that the magnifying glasses the lap desk they made it very 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 comfortable um for me with the illness so vote rehab that can be a second option for you all and if i need to get you the information to the national sector i definitely will that's not a problem at all that, that would be awesome it's just hard because i don't nobody here really understands what's going on with him and because he's a kid and they're like well you know this isn't normal for kids his age to have this and so what does he need and you're like okay well, I need you to give me larger fonts, you know? Well, does he need everything printed? No, not necessarily, but when, you know, he does need something printed, I need to get something printed and, you know, he can't see today. So you're gonna have to do auditory. So it's like they're trying to manipulate and everybody's playing a new game this year that nobody's ever played before. And nobody knows the rules to this virtual school game, you know? Right, now where are you all located? We're in Clarksville, we're in Tennessee. Tennessee. Like okay, gotcha. Hour from Nashville. So okay. And, so they're trying to play their virtual school game, and we're trying to play this sarcoidosis game. And you know, it's like juggling with four hands, and I only have two. So it's gotcha. Totally understand. Yeah. So yes, if you could send me whatever information you have, that would be awesome. And I do absolutely. It gets to the point. Hmm. And it gets to the point too where when you go in to a doctor and they they're they're skittish about their treatment, you have to start treating yourself. You have to start telling them what you need and what what tests you need run, what hospital or clinic you need to go to, because they don't know, and you know more than they do. Well, that's just so it, Mr. Health. You'll, right. you'll have to start treating and diagnosing yourself. Yeah, they just don't know all the symptoms and they just, you know, have no idea. I do have a question. Has anyone been on Imuran? Mm -hmm. is, Which is, one was that? Um, um, I was on Imuran a long yes. time ago. By Dr. Judson. Um, yes, I have. Yeah, that did not um, break up the granuloma. It didn't. Yeah, my uh, pulmonologist wants to start me on that with my lymph nodes that have been that have gone bigger, even though I've been on prednisone. Um, well, they have I was on it and. Sorry. I think she's having issues. Her phone keeps breaking up. Hey, it didn't work or did work? I don't know what she said. Um. 
Yeah, Yvonne, we have an issue. I was on it for five years, and it eventually, my phone, and it eventually burnt my sarcoid out. It didn't. Who, me? Yvonne, did you okay, let me see. see that it took it out? Okay. It uh it burnt mine out. It didn't put it in remission. It completely burnt it out like you would a fireplace. And that was in 2013. The only problem I have now with sarcoid is what it left behind. And I mean, the damage is what you're talking about, right? Yeah. And AFib that it caused. Hmm. That's the only problem I have now. But as far as the sarcoid itself bothering me, it does not. Interesting. So the emulator that when they took me off of prednisone and put me on the emuran, that helped tremendously. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I had um, forty percent of my lung capacity left. I uh, had um, cardiac uh, SART. Um, it had started on the skin, um, a neurological, slight neurological. It had just started before it burned itself out. So, therefore, you know, my, like my fingertip a couple and my right arm are numb a little bit but that could have come from uh, I had breast cancer six months after that so after I had that it could have been the neuropathy that caused the numbness they say it they're not sure which one did so that that was it with me the prednisone, though, was messing up the bones and the muscles, and everything was sore. I could hardly walk. I was on oxygen, and they still want me to sleep in it at night because of the AFib. But other than that, you know, I, I'm doing pretty good. Now, the, now it's easy. For me to get pneumonia. If I get a cold or body around me, you know how we are. It's pneumonia to us. But even in the last, uh, I'd say, year, I haven't had pneumonia. So I guess I'm getting away from that also. Yvonne, do you think that because we're all kind of like shielding that you also didn't get pneumonia? Because this and is I was diagnosed in 1993. Yvonne, so, oh. I'm sorry, Yvonne, you faded out. Spencer? So I, I think I could kind of answer that maybe a little bit. Um, so I get pneumonia just about every year, because once you have it one time, you're more likely to get it over and over and over again. It seems to be a yearly thing for me. Um, you know, crossing my fingers, it won't happen this year. But um, 
I... And Susie, in answer to your question that uh, you asked um, what I did to help me through, because at one point I had just given up and I said, I, I don't even want to live. Spencer, what were you saying? So um, with pneumonia, um, it, like I said, once you get it once, you're bound to happen, you know, you're bound to get it again. Um, best thing I've ever uh, been told was take vitamin D. Um, and I, vitamin D has been kind of a lifesaver. Um, but if you talk to your rheumatologist and say, hey, to avoid, you know, being sick more often, can I take vitamin D? And um, the biggest thing I always say is you got to be your own advocate. Um, you will always know more about your own body than a doctor will. Uh, so if you know something's wrong. Something from the store. My sister, somebody goes to get it. I do not go out. My doctor's appointments are virtual. My doctor's appointments are virtual too and that's I, I think that's know. kind of everybody yeah with the virtual um, now I'm a little bit more adventurous maybe because I'm young um, but I've had a lot more in-person appointments partly because Washington State is allowing in-person appointments now um, but I for my therapist, my rheumatologist, my oncologist, basically all my doctors I can see in person. Um, now, my rheumatologist and I have an understanding that it's in person every three months and um, over the phone every two. So I see him pretty regularly. Um, and for those who um, their doctors may not know a whole lot about that, have them get in touch with Dr. Ragu. Um, at UW Medicine, he is the sarcoid lung specialist. So they he knows how to treat it. Um, I'm lucky that he's up here with me. Um, I don't see him, but all my doctors have either studied under him or talked to him regularly. That's awesome, Spencer. I just would caution about the vitamin D. You want to make sure that you know how it works with your body. Because for me, um, my endocrinologist put me on a high dose of vitamin D and almost instantly I had kidney stones. My yeah. body does not process vitamin D and calcium properly. So I have to be very careful with those. Does anybody take Bactrim to avoid the pneumonia? I'm I'm allergic to any of those the septras the bactrims. Um, I'm not. Um, I'm not. I didn't do bactrim. I do the pneumonia shot every three years though. So um, the new I'm I'm actually scheduled to get it on February the fourth, but since starting that pneumonia shot, um, I hardly ever get the pneumonia period. Okay. I have taken. I haven't taken Bactrim, but um, they were going to put me on erythromycin because I don't build titers to the uh, pneumonia, the pneumococcal. Um, so even with the vaccines, I still don't um, build any immunities to it. So, uh, but they can't do that until I get cleared through cardio because I had a, a abnormal um, ECG. I was going to say about vitamin D. Um, it's always smart to get tested um, at least once a year to see where your vitamin D level is um, because you don't need to supplement if your vitamin D is high enough. And high enough yep. probably means somewhere between 45 to 60. Now, a lot of people are low. Um, and when you find out how low you are, then you can add, and it's safe to add huge amounts, right? 10,000 a day in some in some cases you can do that um, but you should do it always with your doctor and and yeah. also if you're taking vitamin d check 
your levels. I mean, I've come down, when I first got diagnosed with cancer, um, my level was about 18 or 19. And I took, I think initially 2000 a day. And now I just take a maintenance dose of, I think it's 400 a day. But what you need to test for is, it's called vitamin D hydroxy 25 vitamin d3 hydroxy 25 and it's just um it's just in the regular panel so it's probably worthwhile everybody just checking and then of course yeah. you have the other issues like susie's issue which which is another complication but don't just dive in and yeah start taking vitamin d right right spencer of course yeah always check with your doctor i'm not a doctor i'm not a medical professional professional and i don't claim to be one um so but I, I, of course, talked to my doctor and he gave me the green light for it, so. Right. And I was just going to ask anybody who is not receiving a reminder for this group in their email, and if you would like to receive a reminder for, from the group, if you just put your email address in the chat window, we'll make sure that um, you get that before every meeting. Thank you, Rick. And you. just a quick um, hello to Senor Rick. Rick is the gentleman who gives us this lovely room to meet twice a month. So everybody say, hey, and thank you. Thank you, Rick. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. I'm, I'm thank glad you. it's helping people. We lo I love it when I come in and I see all these faces. It's wonderful. <laughs> it really I is. I wanted to add to Rick's comment. I do totally agree about the testing. And with sarcoidosis, not only do you want to get the regular D that's in the panel, you also want to get the D1, 25. It's a different one. And my uh, here, I don't know if everybody has this problem, but it's like pulling teeth to get that test run. And um, but it's important because one of them is the active vitamin D and one's inactive. So you can look low on the regular vitamin D, but actually be high on the other one, which is what happens a lot in sarcoidosis. You said vitamin D and which, which other one? D1, 25. I think that might be the same as the D3 hydroxy 25. I'm wondering if that's the same. Is that different, Susie? Do you I know? Think it different so yours okay. is just i think it's just d20 oh let me look hold on i think they are different i looked at my chart today and it had like three or four vitamin d's on there so i think they are different okay. yeah so the one is just um oh now i lost you guys oh here's a red dot there you are okay <laughs> the one um that you're talking about, Rick, shows up on my labs is just D25. Okay. So I'm learning. It's great. I'm learning too. But yeah, be <laughs> sure you get the right. Be sure you get the test for the D, and be sure yeah. you get the right, the right D. Um, but you know, I, it's it's also very smart to test on a regular basis, especially if you're really low when you start and you start taking big dose doses, then over time you can reduce the amount that you're taking. Yep. And, um, and it, is, it is very true. And uh, along with what both Spencer and Rick are saying, um, long before I was diagnosed, with a sarcoidosis. I went through a pain rehabilitation program at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota, and they had a whole class on what happens when your vitamin D is low, and it actually makes it so you have a lower pain tolerance, so your pain hurts more, and um, you're more susceptible to depression and a bunch of other things. So yeah, it is important to get it tested. And a lot of people go low in the winter, and especially with everybody staying at home, doing everything on the computer, probably a lot more people are low in vitamin D. Yeah, so um, you don't get any, in the Northern Hemisphere, you basically don't get vitamin D from the sun from October to March, because the sun's too low in the sky. Um, so, 
uh, again, you know, that's another time to be testing because you you don't get any you don't get anything naturally. So one of the things about so about that test, uh, my doctors have been testing me for vitamin D probably for ten plus years now. Um, they test they do the blood work and that goes along with the iron and all the natural blood work that we would get as sarcoid patients. Um, and for those who don't like needles, um, I found a little trick. It may be helpful to you, it may not. Um, is right before you get stuck, cough into your elbow. It blocks, uh, for me, it blocks the pain receptors for about a half second so that when that needle drops in, you don't feel it as much. Um, it's a little trick I've picked up from a couple of the nurses I've talked to at Kaiser Permanente, and it seems to work for me. Say that again, Spencer. What do you do? I so I actually write. I have the nurse or whoever is doing my blood work dash needles. Um, you know, count down from three, and um, right before that, before they get to one, before they stick me, I actually cough into my elbow just a tiny bit, like just a light <laughs> kind of thing, and it tends to block the pain receptors. So if you don't like needles, that's one trick I've learned over the several, several years of dealing with needles and sarcoid. That is great. I love that because because all the time, and not just in this group, in all the groups, you know, we always hear people complaining about needles. So um, we're going to use that. Thank you, Spencer. Good. I'm glad I could share something that, that was helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, anybody watch the art of cuss words? I'm gonna throw that out there. It does, yes, Wendy. I'm sitting here and I'm like, well, they say if you just say fuck over and over and over again, your pain tolerance increases like by like 30 seconds. I'm dead, y'all. Yeah. Yeah, it cracks. It is so funny. You guys yeah, all have to get it. It is so funny. Really? I can see the doctor. It's it's I, worth it. Yeah, I was in the hospital last week and I said to the doctors, I said, fuck this COVID, <laughs> fuck this COVID. And they were all like, you know, you can't see through the mask, but they're all <laughs> it really, I don't know. Y'all, if somebody needs four hours, I don't even think it was four hours, Wendy. What was it like maybe an hour and a half long, four episodes on Netflix? It was perfect. It definitely made this one laugh. Um I, I would advise it if you need to get through pain. Yeah, it. Um, but the the amazing part was it is that they went through you know the word you know bitch, which is a, a name of a dog, female dog. You know, there's different names for bitches. <laughs> it was just so funny, and they had all these like you know doctors of linguists, and it was just amazing, just amazing. <laughs> So, um, oh, Rip, were you about to say something? I'll let no. you go first. Okay, no, so. No, no, no. Oh, yes, I am. I'm about to say okay. goodbye because I got to run over to the other meeting. But as Kathleen knows, I always love to come by and say hello to my Saki friends. And um, it's great to see you all. And this was a yeah. 15 minutes. So I'll see you. Uh, I'll try and stop by the next meeting. Bye. Thank you, Rip. Thank Bye. you, Rick. Bye-bye. So one of the things that I do, and I find it helpful for me, especially when I go see doctors, um, is I have this thing called a pain journal, where if I'm feeling something off, you know, I have an ache in my shoulder that's not going away, I'll write it down. And then the date on top of, you know, hey, the pain level was X, Y, Z, you know. Um, and I actually just bring that notebook. It's probably, it's almost a binder now. Um, and I just bring that to my doctor and he has that documented every time. How, hi, hi, Spencer. I hope you're feeling better. I'm feeling all right today. Guys, I have to go, thank you. Uh, when is the next meeting again, Kathleen? Uh, it's going to be the first Tuesday of next month. Awesome. Great, guys. I Thank didn't look up that part. You're, you're throwing me under the bus here. <laughs> February 2nd. Thank you.
So February 2nd, there you have, I may not be on that one. I think I have Remicade around that time. So, and, uh, but it was nice having you online. Yeah. And I well, be you safe. Guys. Thank you guys. Take care. Thank you. Be safe. Thanks for being here. So I know uh, other than uh, Leah, uh, I think we've gotten a, a hellos to everybody. So I did want to bring up two articles, one that Wendy sent me today, which Wendy, I have read that in its completion and it's so exciting. So um, what she sent me, I will put up on the chat in a few minutes, is the monocytes could be a key player in sarcoidosis pathogenesis, a study shows. So that will be very interesting for everybody to read. Get us. Got it. Leah was sending something on the online. And then I think I mentioned this, Susie, last time, but it has hit quite a few of the places. So there's a TNF alpha inhibitor. It's called XTMAB16 has been granted FDA's approval of an orphan drug designation for sarcoidosis. I have sent that indeed to my rheumatologist. I'm gonna put both links up in the chat within a minute or so, because I'm gonna send it back to Susie. Oh, you know who we didn't say hello, good evening to? Is Miss Trina, but I will come back to you, Miss Trina, I promise. So sorry about that. Um, so I, I just finding this very interesting because one of my thoughts was, and, and you know, I sit at home all day other than cooking and baking and cleaning and all the other typical stuff and sitting on the couch for hours on end is I think about these things. So like, for instance, COVID, COVID really affects the lungs. It affects a lot of other places. But what is the first thing usually that sarcoidosis hits for most of the patients is lungs. So could this be indeed something in the future that may actually help us? I don't know. But these two are, and, and the other one that I had mentioned about Brian Young with uh, the Foundation for Sarcoidosis Research, his paper is not out yet. I've been told it should be out in four to six weeks. If so, I will be sending that because that's a cardiologist from Yale who's been working with other doctors and they have found some positivities with Zelljams. So, but nobody can do anything until we get those. So Susie, if you don't mind, I'm gonna, I will put those, those links up. And Miss Trina, can I say good evening to you and how are you doing? Are you gonna talk to us tonight? Oh, she must have someone in the room. All right, so Susie, I'm gonna go back to you. Okay, so I was thinking, Jaden, I'm I want, oh, Hi, sorry. Go ahead. I was trying to figure this thing out. Um, I'm just in a lot of pain here lately, um, just bearing it all and getting up, rolling out two hours late for work, hour late for work, and uh, just, just managing, that's all. No complaints, just grateful I'm still here living and breathing and, getting to uh to bond with the grandkids that's about it well thank you we're really glad to have you here trina and Jaden, i felt like i wanted to apologize for being i don't know i you're being so young and getting diagnosed and then I'm on here crying about how I can't stand having sarcoidosis and also to Elizabeth I mean to everybody actually but you guys especially I want to let you know it's not like this for everybody but usually I have found the people that become advocates and show up to the support groups are the ones that have the chronic systemic issues um, but I have people here in our support group in Utah that do like really great. There's this one guy at Humira and he is the general manager of the aquarium up in Ogden. I don't know. That's way far north of me. 
And um, then there, I don't know, other people manage their sarcoidosis and they have full-time jobs and stuff. That's just not my experience. So I'm hoping that you have a wonderful experience and that not Susie, you don't have one. <laughs> yeah, right. I mean, Susie, I do have a question though. With neurosarcoid, do you see that a lot? Um, yeah, in the sense that I'm trying to think. I'm wondering, you know that phenomenon where you buy a white truck and then you start seeing white trucks everywhere? I kind of wonder about that with Neurosarc because I have it in my peripheral uh, neurological system. And um, I've met several people that also have it. Um, so I've met a lot of people with neurosarcoidosis. But I think that my view of it may be skewed just because of the people that I've met. I think that it's more rare than it appears to me, if that makes sense. I, yeah, it does. Uh, but I'm not sure, um, Leo, what, what, are, what is, um, are you there? I don't know. Oh, okay. I thought she left the room. Um, can you like um, explain exactly what your son has? Does he just have the, the sarcoid or is there something else? Um, so they found the sarcoidosis in the, the lymph node. Sorry. So they removed a piece of the lymph node from his neck, which looked like a, a muscle coming out of the side of the neck. So they removed that um, and biopsied it. Vanderbilt couldn't diagnose it. So they sent it to um, the Institute for Health in DC area. And they came back and stated it was undiagnosable, but that there were granulomas present. Um, so it came back to rheumatology at Vanderbilt and they said that it was sarcoidosis. So that's when they then connected this with his eyes because he had the lymph node, but then also was centrally blind. So they were trying to tell me that they thought that it was either lymphoma or an infection when they put him in the hospital. So it all happened within a week's time. Um, so they were trying to disconnect the eyes versus the lymph nodes and tell me that they were two different things. So I took them to my husband's uh, TBI doctor on Fort Campbell. And I was like, somebody please, I, I know her personally. So I'm like, is my son full of shit? And he really, you know, he's just playing me or can he really not see? And she ended up sending an emergency MRI because she thought that he had a tumor because of the central vision loss that he had. Um, so they're lucky that we got him up there because it was so quick that, I mean, he had so much loss, um, color loss, that, I mean, the whole nine. And they kept him up there until they could really say that doing IV steroids was going to actually help it come back. So they kept him for a week and then released him with just, just that. They didn't have no treatment plan, but he started to uh, relapse again and he started to lose more vision. So as of last couple of weeks, um, they just put him on the prednisone eye drops and they have stopped his Humira injections as of yesterday and said not to give them to him anymore because they want to start Remicade because he constantly has relapses left and right. And he's on weekly Humira injections plus two grams of Celsept. He relapses at 15 milligrams of prednisone all the time. We can't get him lower than that, but they don't want him on the prednisone anymore because of all of the side effects that come along with it. Um, but then they throw this in there and it's like, you know, cataracts is, you know, looking good in his future, you know, and somebody at 70 year old bouncing back from cataracts normally versus somebody with uveitis bouncing back is totally different. So trying to save his vision and give him the right treatment plan, but yet still let him live a normal life is different. So, but they're also saying because he started projectile vomiting, they sent him in for a scope to make sure that all these meds weren't giving him an ulcer and they diagnosed him with EOE, which is like an esophagus um, issue. Um, it's like, a inflammatory, like inflammation of the esophagus. And so he, 
as the long as the child has been able to walk, he's always thrown up and made it to the toilet, but he could not, he would literally be on class and he'd just throw up next to him. So um, he goes back Tuesday to get another scope to see whether or not the omeprazole is helping because that's what they said to do is do 40 milligrams of omeprazole twice a day to see if they could keep, you know, it, keep it under control. But then it is the sarcoidosis related to the EOE, you know, are the migraines that he's having related to the sarcoidosis? Like, you know, trying to connect all these dots and say just because he's been diagnosed, how much of it actually is related to the sarcoidosis, you know? Um, because they're all so new, you know, he's never had the vision loss like this. He's had regular kid vision loss, you know. Um, he's always had migraines, um, but they're saying that the prednisone should help to control the migraines if it was related to the sarcoidosis. And it's, it's, does that answer your question, Wendy? <laughs> yeah, you did. You you know what? You're a beautiful person, and what you do for your son is just beautiful. And Thanks. I think we're all in amazed of you right now. Oh, hey, I would do it over and over again. Hopefully, I know. So, oh, go ahead, go ahead, finish. Sorry. No, so I'm good. Of, so I can't speak to the EOE, but I can sort of speak to the cataracts and uveitis on my end. Um, I've had it forever. Um, if you find a good eye doctor, that's the biggest thing. One that you can consistently go back to, and they know sarcoid, or at least you can they're willing to learn sarcoid. Um, that's been a lifesaver. Um, but I I was on the prednisone eye drops as well. Um, but since being on Remicade, uh, they don't want me doing the eye drops for prednisone. Uh, they do have me on methotrexate, however. Um, that's I think that's pretty common amongst all of us is methotrexate. Um, but that the cataracts and the uveitis, it it can fade and come back uh, pretty regularly. So, you know, as long as your eye doctor's on top of it, he, mm -hmm. he should be fine. Yeah, well, but cataracts think... doesn't go away. I mean, isn't cataracts like a permanent? They are. Yeah. yeah. But the, the uveitis can sort of fade and the scarring will be there you don't as want my eye doctor. Cataracts. Yeah, no. So what they're telling me, I mean, he's seeing a retina doctor um, and Dr. Kim at the Eye Institute is supposed to be the best of the best. He's a retina doctor and Jaden relapsed and Dr. Kim was off and I pretty much was insistent on bringing him back up there. And he, so they let him see another doctor that works underneath him. And Dr. Kim kind of got mad and he told everybody that if he is not there and Jaden is having a flare up that they are to immediately message him and he is the only person to treat Jaden. Good. Wow, that's really good. Dr. Kim, that's, yeah. Yeah, is, oh, it, Dr. Kim. It also makes me a little nervous because Dr. Kim, um, he's, he's much different than I'm used to dealing with. You know, as a caregiver, I'm used to dealing with doctors that um, help me understand what's going on. So I'm, I'm a TBI wife, like, I got brain injury down packed, you know? And so I'm used to somebody explaining it to me and me learning it and understanding it and being able to dictate it back to you because I understand what it is. And he doesn't have that same bedside manner. Um, he's not that his nationality has anything to do with it, but he's Asian and he's, he's, he's through and through. He it just, it speaks very fast and he expects me to understand what it is that he says. So his bedside manner kind of cuts me, and I'm like, I don't know. I it's don't know how not, to get. It's not a male chauvinistic peg. <laughs> well, I mean that. Yes. I, I mean, think, I don't think Doctor He's very. Um, uh, he's he's very knowledgeable. He just rushes through everything and expects me to understand it, so it makes it hard. So I'm like, that's great that he wants to treat Jaden, but you're treating him and I don't know the questions to ask. It's like yeah. you guys say, you know, you have to be the advocate, you have to do your own research, you have to do this. And it's like, I don't really understand what it is sometimes that he's telling me, you know, he does these images and he takes pictures of Jaden's eyes and you should see me in there. I'm like a little, and I'm like, so, and go home and zoom in and record and try to see 
what it is that he's seeing because he looks at the images but then doesn't tell me what he sees and what he doesn't see and then like i learned from his rheumatologist just last week when he was talking about changes to the remicade he said um he's like well i see dr kim said that you know he sees something on the front of jayden's eyes and i said see that's what makes me mad because dr kim doesn't tell me that Dr. Kim puts it in his notes and says it, but then he doesn't tell me that he sees anything. He just throws these at me and it's like, hey, well, yeah, we're not it's not good. And so it's like, I'm hearing it from another person and I'm like, so I, that's why I say, I don't know if that's just, I don't think he's male chauvinistic. I think that's just his demeanor. And I, I mean, I've got that from a lot of just- Yeah, I had that with my first group of doctors. Yeah. And then they also, and, and I didn't know anything, you know, until, you know, I got in this group and they said, well, we're, you know, we don't know anything about sarcoid, you know, they were all like afraid. And then they just sent me over to, you know, a rare disease specialist, but like, they were like geniuses. Okay. Neurologists are pretty smart. They have to, you know, think your head, you know, mm -hmm. but they, one of them, I swore was autistic, but their bedside manner, they were so rude to me. I yeah. felt like a piece of, oh, let's say it, shit. <laughs> yeah. Lydia, may yeah. I make the suggestion to you? I don't know if you're familiar with, you can get your um, your son's, um, they call it patient's notes at the end of each visit. There's nothing there. And then start formulating your questions according to that last visit. Does that make sense? Yeah, but there's nothing there. Yeah, sometimes I, I have doctors and they don't have the note, they don't even write notes. Yeah. yeah, there's there's nothing there. I can um Wish. So I even, I've called his person and I'm like his uh receptionist. Um and I'm like, hey, there's nothing there. I need to get such and such for the school. So like when I was setting up um Spencer for the IEP, I'm getting his 504 changed over to an IEP. And he's like putting in there that Jaden's um UVI this is is stabilized. And I'm like if he's so stable, then why are we upping his prednisone? Why can is are he is he pouring water from his eyes? He can't hold his eyes open. He's light sensitive. Like these are things where a stable person would be able to function normal. That would be stabilized. Oh well, we've got a stable treatment plan, but it's really not because you're changing his meds. So that's you know what you can do, Leah. Leah, call Trina's on to something though. You can call the office and ask them. Can you, I'm sorry to say, but I, I don't understand the doctor. And this is my son. Can you please um, have him like explain it to me? Or could someone in the office speak to him? They, they probably can't understand him either. No, well, that's, that's, been, that's where I've been kind of reaching out to other people and like on the sarcoidosis pages. And like Wendy and I, I mean, I met Wendy on one of the pages where it's just kind of, yeah, you know, months ago. Yeah, it was back in July where, you know, she just kind of sent me a message and I kind of explained stuff back and forth. And, you know, we talked a little bit and I'm picking up bits and pieces. And when I have a question about something, I'm like, you know, hey, who's been on Remicade versus Humero? You know, pros and cons. Give it to me, you know, and just what's the best thing that I can do for him? You know, he's nervous about it. He doesn't want to lose his vision. Um, we just had his prescription changed and in a year he's gone from a negative five to a negative eight you know in glasses so he lost significant amount just with that uh with one lapse or what uh Mary. i don't know what you want to call it so i don't know i mean i'm trying to keep him from being nervous about it you know <laughs> making sure he's in therapy but now i also have to turn around and explain it to my husband who has brain injury so mm -hmm trying to explain it to him and get him to understand and Jaden falling out about not being able to communicate what's going on with him and having fits or tantrums it's like I don't so Leah why are you are you able to get a social worker for your child for your um your son are you there at the I don't know if you're going to the clinic or are you going to a private physician? No, this is military. No, no, no. He's he's Mil the military. We're not seeing him right now. His PCM is through the military, but he's at Vanderbilt. All his providers are at Vanderbilt. His neurologist, his rheumatologist, his 
Are uh, they are they having these conversations about him? Are they talking with each other or are they just talking directly to you? Um, they're supposed to be talking to each other, the rheumatologist and the eye doctor. So the ophthalmologist and the, the rheumatologist, they joined together to say that they were going to um, do the Remicade. So between the two of them, now whether or not they've talked to the rheumatologist or not, I'm not or not the rheumatologist but the neurologist i'm not 100 percent sure because she's put him on um topamax for the migraines that he's been having so and the topamax has helped like greatly now you know but then i get a message from the hey Jaden, stop i get a message from the pharmacist that's like hey put him on folic acid because this stuff has got to be damaging his cells like he's on all these things right now you know, yeah, you know what, Leah? I was on the Topamax too with the with the Remicade. It was not a good thing. I so, dried out real fast. I was drinking gallons of water, um, and uh, having severe headaches. Yeah, I actually had to quit Topamax after just taking it for two days because it was hurting my stomach so bad. So he had stomach pains too, but he seems that part of it seemed to just kind of. They have pass. alternatives to the Topamax. Uh, but he's not having any migraines and he's actually able to get online and do schoolwork because that's, you know, that was the other thing where it was like he was down for days with the migraines. And it's like at some point he still has to catch up in his schoolwork because, you know, it's like you're literally standing there. If you're not beating one bush, you're beating the next bush. Because whether it's done, whether he does it or I do it or it doesn't get done, one way he's still got to get through school. You know what I'm saying? And he's a high schooler at that. So it's just, it, there's just a lot of moving pieces, I guess. I don't, you know, it's no woe is me or woe is him. It's how do you, like, how are we going to get through this? How, what's the next step? So I I'm suggest you get a case manager if it's at all possible at the hospital. Yeah. <laughs> help kind of coordinate things and making sure that these physicians are having these discussions with each yeah. other. Okay. Yeah. I'll the other, so the other thing I would recommend um, possibly is if it's also, trouble with when schoolwork. You, when you leave the doctor, before you leave his office, Oh yeah, she's probably saying get no ask yeah. um them to get notes from what happened in the office. Yeah. Right, Yvonne? So but but uh about the schoolwork thing, what I would recommend is get in touch with all his teachers and have them email you any classwork or homework and you can possibly print it out. Um that's what my teachers did when I was in high school and middle school and elementary school. Um, um, they they would send it via email, and I would just do it that day, and then turn it right back to them pretty much same day. Yvonne, yeah. you're on two um, things, so it's hard to hear you because you're on two signals, and you're on three, actually, four. Oh, yeah. Yeah, um, Yvonne, I, I think it's, she, her Wi-Fi is slow in that area. He's got four of them on, and it's mm -hmm. just... She's so, you're coming like in I and think, out. I think we're out of time and we need to wrap up, you guys. I'm sorry. No, you're good. It's all I good. Thank you guys very much. Spencer, thank you for all your help and yeah. everybody for your advice. Thank and, you. Oh, and, 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 you're, you're, you know what? You have a wonderful mother that loves you so much. And, and, Leah, and, I, and you have such a beautiful smile. I hope I can meet you someday. Maybe, maybe I can come to Tennessee someday and visit you. And, and, and this goes for everybody, um, day or night. If you need to reach out to somebody for advice or whatever, Facebook is the quickest way to get to me. Um, just send me a message, hey, I'm going through this. Mm -hmm. And I will give you the best advice that I can and how mm -hmm. I would deal with it. But other than that, uh, have a good night, everybody. Thank you, Spencer. Yeah, thank you, Spencer. And Leah, Thank you, Elizabeth. I hope you come back. Leah, I will find you um, because I also have people who are in your area and at Fort Campbell. 
Oh, sweet. Yeah. And, like sarcoidosis people? Um, no, in the medical field by you. Ooh, at Bach? Yeah. Oh, right. okay. So I'm going to find you and I sent you my phone number too, so you can always reach out to me. Okay, perfect. Is it in the chat? Oh, yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. All right. Take your time. I'm not going to shoot everybody out of here. Yvonne, are you still with me? I think she is. Yvonne, can her face. Yvonne, could you stay for a few minutes? All right. Thank you, Susie. You are welcome, Leah. Thanks for coming. Bye, Leah. Bye, guys. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Uh, I'm just going to dismiss anybody who hasn't been in. Excellent. Hi, Vaughn. So I know your, um, uh, I guess Wi-Fi or whatever is a little slow there. So I don't know if you have a computer one day, but if you do, and maybe if you and I could find some time just for the two of us, or even if Susie's at home and feeling better, she wasn't feeling well today, but I knew you were coming on, so I wanted to be there with you. Here. And, uh, <laughs> So, um, yes. yes. So maybe one day it, when you, can you get on a computer. Okay. So, <laughs> so I think one day, if you can, maybe the three of us can come on and I can show you the chat what's going on. and Susie can help you. Cause uh, this, this is not scary as you see. Yeah, I think the scariest part always for me is coming on and, oh, my God, who's mm -hmm. going to be there? Okay. If she, yeah. whatever day you want, I'm, I'm available. Okay. So I'll, Available I'll be, anytime. I know Susie's not feeling well. And Susie, yeah. thank you so yeah. much. And I forgot to thank you with everybody there. I apologize. That's actually, okay. You're welcome. Hold on. <laughs> Guess what else?